Hey guys, this is our last lecture where we finally made it to lecture number five of five. This is the last one for the Cold War unit that we're in. We're talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is the closest America ever gets to an actual nuclear war with the Soviet Union in which we're launching nukes. Basically, our hand was over the buzzer. President Kennedy, the president in charge over the Cuban Missile Crisis, he did have his finger over it, but Thanks to him and also the Soviet uh, Prime Minister Nikita Khrushchev, cooler heads prevailed and we didn't have a nuclear war. But this is the closest we get. We never have gotten to DEFCOM 1. This is Defense Command number one, as in we are in an all-out nuclear war. It's happening. Number two is as, as close as we get to this, in which we're at heightened ready. we got planes in the air. The submarines are uh, in battle station mode and the airplanes uh, are in the air 24-7. Did I say that? Our missiles are ready and they're fueled up, uh, ready to potentially launch at the Soviet Union. So that happens during this 13-day crisis that we call the Cuban Missile Crisis. We'll get into some of the background. Why is Cuba important? What happens to them? And why do they become communist under Fidel Castro? And then ultimately uh, help precipitate almost a nuclear war. And thank goodness we don't ever get there uh, and that cooler heads did prevail. But this lecture is about that moment in time where during the Cold War, we were the closest to coming into a nuclear conflict with the Soviet Union, actual all out war. But again, thank goodness we did not. So grab your notes. This is our uh, last lecture. And I'll also talk about the ending of the Cold War. So what does it look like when the Cold War is over and ended? So I'll try to summarize it up at the end and how the Cold War ends. Okay, so this is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, you see it's uh, found this great GIF. Uh, so here's Kennedy. He's going to be the president in charge and, and uh, commander in chief during this Cuban Missile Crisis. Here's Nikita Khrushchev. His face looks like he's the man on the moon, right? And then here's Fidel Castro. He has the famous Castro hat. It used to be sort of in style. I haven't seen it for a decade or two, but when I was in college, it came back again as a cool style. Uh, but then here's what we just ended up finding out is that there's missile silos being set up with nuclear missiles on Cuba. And that's what freaks us out and precipitates almost a nuclear war is because we found out there were nukes right off of our shore, Cuba being very close to Florida and the rest of our southeast, southeastern yeah, United States. Here's Kennedy again, and then here's Fidel Castro. Uh, and Cuba, again, it's right here. Here's Florida right here. And then here's Cuba, which we've had heavy participation in ever since Cuba uh, sort of got its independence from us, really, from uh, sort of it liberating it in the Spanish-American War, if you remember that. And so we're going to be heavily involved uh, economically in Cuba. We're going to have American citizens there starting businesses and controlling businesses. And we've always had a vested interest because just because they are so close at one time. Uh, there were Americans that were advocating, hey, we just go down. This is in the 1850s, 60s. Uh, and one of the things that led into the Civil War, and we thought, hey, we could go take over uh, Cuba and then enter it into a slave state and balance out an, a free state so that we have two states, a free and a slave state entering into the Union at the same time. Uh, but that did not happen, uh, maybe for our benefit to continue to sort of prolong having slavery in the United States um, and get into that civil war faster. So, but anyway, so if you remember the Spanish-American War, we're going to help liberate Cuba from uh, Spanish possession as a colony. Uh, we didn't like how Spain was treating Cuba and its citizens for decades. And uh, because they were so close, uh, we didn't like sort of that Spain was involved so close to our borders as well. So, but once they declared their independence, we get heavily involved economically. And by the early 1950s, US businesses are gonna run most all of Cuba. It's gonna be seen as sort of that place to go and plunk some money and investment and make some quick returns and even long-term investments. We're gonna own 90% of the mines, pretty much all of the oil uh, that's being discovered there. Uh, and then half of the sugar crop and 3 million acres of land are owned by US businesses. And uh, the leader in charge, his name was Batista at, time, at the time. His, he was a dictator of Cuba. He's pictured right here. And so he kind of ruled with the iron fist. He was very friendly with the U.S., obviously, and we had a lot of influence. Uh, we had a, a special amendment we wrote into the Cuban constitution that said we can intervene for any time. So really any leader that came about had to be friendly with us. Uh, but his problem is he did not improve life for the Cubans. Uh, especially the lower class. So they are working these jobs 
benefiting the United States and benefiting the upper class of uh, Cuba. But uh, he was seen as really not doing much to help all the Cubans, uh, which I think in retrospect, if Cubans saw how they were going to be treated under the communist regime that's been in place since the 1950s, uh, they probably would have kept uh, Batista uh, as their leader instead of have the Castro family, first Fidel, and now Raul is the current uh, leader, president, really dictator of Cuba. So in 1953, there was a failed attempt by Fidel Castro. He enters the scene. He's a, a native uh, Cuban, and he doesn't like Batista and the way he's um, sort of ruling things. So he wants power. He tries to get it legitimately. And then he's just like, well, I'm going to raise sort of a merry band of men and, and come out from the mountains and, and uh, overthrow you, Batista. And so puts together a sort of ragtag military, and it doesn't go so well for him, but he's able to escape with his life and ends up fleeing to uh, Mexico and ends up meeting a pretty pivotal man there who helps sort of retrain him and rethink how he can uh, defeat Batista. If he just absorbs some more communism, absorbs some special communist tactics uh, that were kind of new in the world at the time, then he could uh, overthrow Batista, which he's gonna do later. And that uh, pivotal person he meets in Mexico, his name is Ernesto uh, Che Guevara. And so you've probably seen this picture before. It's probably one top 10 in history, very sort of stoic picture taken of uh, Che Guevara. Uh, he himself is a doctor and he travels uh, through Mexico, Central America, and actually South America on a motorcycle. And he goes and sees the tremendous poverty uh, that he believes is caused by uh, capitalism and it's sort of its deficit. So he, uh, as he's seen all these poor people and, and uh, emaciated and and uh, malnourished people throughout uh, all of Latin America. And he gets really upset, studies government, tries to find a better solution, which he believes is communism, which is gonna create equality. So there's no one that's poor or rich. There's no uh, differences in economic uh, status. And so he's gonna meet up with Fidel Castro in Mexico and be like, hey, like I'm onto this new idea of communism as well. I've uh, studied government and studied warfare and found that there's a type of warfare that's gonna be very effective against a large opponent, like let's say America, or let's say the Cuban government under Batista. And so he writes sort of his military findings in a book called Guerrilla Warfare. It's basically like the terrorist playbook and how uh, you basically hit large scale uh, governments and infrastructure uh, to win uh, wars of independence. Uh, and so he's not just going to sponsor and help Fidel Castro in Cuba. He's going to go to Africa and sponsor revolutions in Congo, which leads to the tremendous mess that Congo, uh, the DRC is what it's called, still is into this day and reeling from the effects of what Che started there in the uh, 1950s. He's going to go to Bolivia, where he's eventually going to get killed by the CIA there because he becomes United States enemy number one. And uh, Bolivia becomes a mess uh, after he goes there, too. So and is recovered, but it's still uh, one of the poorest, if not the poorest country in South America. Uh, here's his dead body after he gets assassinated by the CIA. We need proof. Um, he ends up losing his leg, but his arm gets cut off uh, for the fingerprints to confirm that it is him. It is him. He's deceased here. He's not still alive. But uh, So we ended up getting rid of public enemy number one. Why? Because he's going around to all these countries uh, that were democratic to some degree, were a capitalist to some degree, and then was sponsoring these communist and very bloody uh, revolutions against uh, those governments and against those peoples. And so he did have the support, but of a small minority in each of those countries. And uh, sort of you can see in the wake of uh, the revolutions he started has been tremendous chaos in those countries ever since, like Cuba, very still repressive communist country, you could say, but especially Congo, the DRC, Bolivia, and he's going to uh, try to help Angola a little bit too, are going to be still uh, reeling decades after uh, the 1950s, even to today. But his sort of what he was touting in this guerrilla for warfare is, hey, you fight in small cells. You don't have a large military gathering and confront another large, stronger military that's just suicide. So what you do is you have a small cell of fighters. You're training one person. They train the other small cell. It could be men, women, children involved in this. And you're just focusing on fear in which you go and you plant explosives that blow up a bridge or you blow up a government building or you uh, assassinate government leaders or the mayor of a town. And uh, so really 
the people don't know where the gorillas are, who they are, where they're coming at, because there's no marked uniform. Um, and so you're really destroying supply lines and trying to uh, just basically uh, try to change the mindset of people to just give in to what you want to be done with warfare and sort of its nagging influence. So very pivotal writing. It's still out there. And uh, I swear, if you download it, probably the FBI is going to start tracking you and your computer and see what you are watching. So, but with armed with these tax tactics from Shea, Fidel Castro returns back to Cuba. He lands uh, on Cuba and goes up to the mountains and he has his quick followers that were left over come back to him again and he trains them up in these new techniques and gathers more followers that are upset with uh, Batista. And so uh, he continues to fight about a three year civil war, two year civil war from the mountains and continues to gain more territory and also more followers. He never really wins a majority of the Cuban people, uh, but he just kind of wears down the Cuban military and wears down Batista. Uh, Batista is asking for help from the US and from others and we don't want to necessarily get involved. Uh, we'll give uh, weapons, but we won't ever extend our military to go support the Batista, which might have been the dagger in the coffin. Uh, for Batista. So by January 7, 1959, Castro takes over the whole country. He marches on the capital city of Havana. And he, in kind of broad daylight and through some uh, really, uh, you know, anyone that did not support him uh, really was executed. There's going to be thousands of refugees that are going to flee Cuba and come to America. So that's why Florida, especially New York City, there's a huge Cuban population population. It's a lot of Cubans that fled uh, during the Cuban revolution in the 1950s and early 1960s because they were coming here for amnesty because they would have been executed or in prison for decades, maybe the rest of their life if they did not flee. Because uh, that's what happens in a communist revolution. They take over and they wipe out anyone that had influence, anyone that had power or anyone that had money and they take all that stuff and redistribute it to everyone else that didn't have it. Um, and so it's always a bloody affair. And that's why any communist revolution is met with lots and lots of violence and is not a great thing. So, but Castro's goal was to redistribute wealth under this communistic system. And then he kicks out U.S. businesses, destroys them, steals their stuff. And then the U.S. businesses are not allowed to operate in Cuba. So for, for the Cuban people, that felt good to kind of throw off those shackles of U.S. business so maybe they can generate and start stuff for themselves. It really hasn't happened that way and really doesn't happen in that way in communist countries. And it's what we've seen in history. So but feeling sort of embarrassed that we let we kind of am, am abandoned Batista and he gets kicked out uh, and, and we give him asylum here in the United States. Well, the Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower has this great idea. Hey, let's use the CIA and train up these Cuban exiles that just came for asylum. Let's train them to be military men and, and to go recapture Cuba. And so uh, Eisenhower, though, is going to leave as president as Kennedy gets elected and gets inaugurated. And so he's left with kind of the blueprints for this invasion of you're not using American military. You're actually using Cubans that are left there. You retrain them, you supply them with, with weapons, and then kind of you let them go back to Cuba and, and see what happens. So Kennedy allows sort of the invasion to go forward. It's called the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, because he didn't want to look like he was soft on communism, like the previous Democratic president, which was Truman, allowing China to fall. So Kennedy allows this to happen to look like he's strong against communism, but at the last minute withdrew air support, fearing that if we had like an American jet that got shot down and American servicemen died, that would involve us in a bigger conflict with Cuba and therefore might involve the Soviet Union, who's trying to come to the defense of Cuba and try to protect them. So it, this invasion ends up failing because it's just ground forces against a stronger communist force that was kind of waiting for them. Uh, a lot of these people get uh, captured, some of them get executed and in prison. Some of them were able to negotiate back, but it becomes a major humiliation to Kennedy. And then also for Cuba, Fidel Castro's like, oh my gosh, like America might do this again. America might come and invade my borders. So I need something that's going to protect me for now and forevermore from the Americans from ever invading or ever using Cuban troops or using their own military or having airstrikes against me. I need that one weapon that's going to protect me forever. And what is that weapon going to be? Yes, nuclear missiles. And so in 1960, 
basically Cuba's like, hey, we're communists. Come on, Soviet Union, protect us, help us. And Nikita Khrushchev, he's pictured right here. He's the prime minister or premier of the Soviet Union. Here's Fidel Castro. Yes, they do have a very cordial relationship. And uh, so Khrushchev does agree uh, to help Castro and secretly supply Cuba with uh, nuclear missiles to defend themselves in case we ever try to invade again. And also the USSR gives uh, uh, money and it doesn't, doesn't help Cuba, it helps the Soviet Union too, because now they don't have to launch missiles at us from the Soviet Union or some places in Europe. Now they have them right next to us. So if they need to attack us, that missile is going to come in a matter of minutes instead of 15 to 20 minutes, depending on where the missile is coming from. So it would give us more warning come from the Soviet Union, gives us less warning come from Cuba if they have to hit us first and hit us quickly. So by 1962, so we are now sort of catching wind that these missiles are coming via ship. We have sort of spy planes. We have intel that's coming to us that, yeah, they are bringing in nuclear weapons, but we don't have necessarily the confirmation to know for sure. That's what our secret agents are telling us. And so we start flying over special jets that fly really high up. It's like low earth orbit. They're kind of like spaceships or pilots are wearing uh, oxygen masks because they're so high up into the atmosphere. But there's only thing on these planes, they're made to be super lightweight. Our camera's on the bottom and they take pictures. It's kind of like Google Maps before Google Maps taking pictures of the earth and what's going on uh, before satellites are able to make their good pictures. So we have these special planes. And so these planes are called the U-2 plane, just like the band. The band named themselves after these U-2 spy planes because they were that cool and supposed to fly so high. And so, uh, but by October uh, 1962, the U.S. spy planes over Cuba do spot ballistic missile sites for these nuclear warheads. And we spot several of them, three of them. And uh, so they have, we confirm that these missiles are inter intermediate range ballistic missiles that can reach 2,500 miles, and also that they have medium range ballistic missiles of 1,300 mile range. And so what is within that range then? Well, every American city really can be reached by intermediate range ballistic missile, except for Seattle. Woo, yeah, except for Seattle. And so, but that is going to freak us out. You see, it used to be top secret. This gets declassified. You see 1978. So it's kind of cool to look at some old records that used to be top secret that are now declassified. So Kennedy, President Kennedy, you see two days later, gets photos of these missiles. And again, the photos have to be developed and that takes time and analyzed by CIA analysts. Finally, Kennedy gets it. And uh, after the CIA is freaking out and then Kennedy starts freaking out and obviously Seattle is the only major US city out of range. And then here's the pictures that they are seeing. They're seeing these uh, uh, sort of uh, semi trucks uh, that have uh, the missiles on them. Here's a missile ready tent. And then they have these fuel trailers to be able to fuel up the missiles with, uh, to be able to launch at the United States if needed to. And so Kennedy calls together like his cabinet, uh, his executive committee, which he calls XCOM. They're supposed to be the brightest minds in the country. Some of them were, some of them were not, um, <laughs> you know, as history would prove. Uh, but uh, so he calls them together and says, hey, here's what's going on. What should we do? Uh, it's looking like we could be attacked in a minute or less coming with a missile coming from Cuba. We're going to have no way to retaliate really against the Soviet Union with, without having much time. Um, and so by October 22nd, Kennedy decides to make his message public and says, hey, we know about these missiles in Cuba. Soviet Union, stop, take them away. And so, but then the American public knows about it and they freaked out and Kennedy tries to use this to leverage the Soviet Union to pull the missiles out, uh, which they didn't decide to do at first, but Kennedy demands that Khrushchev, hey, take these missiles out. And that freaks the American public out. So once we know the details, yep, it does eventually work to Kennedy's uh, sort of goals to withdraw the missiles, but not initially, and it freaks the American public out to know that we are that close uh, to potentially a nuclear war. So our U.S. demands, what do we do? Well, we uh, create, we use our Navy to create a naval quarantine of Cuba. We can't call it a blockade because that's an act of war. So we just say, hey, we're going to quarantine you, Cuba. We're not letting ships in or ships out because we're afraid that you're going to transport no more nukes into Cuba. And uh, we also say, hey, Cuba, if we detect that missiles are fired from you, we're not just going to attack you. We're going to retaliate upon the USSR with 
anything that's left of us to retaliate with. So just by the way, if you launch stuff at us, yeah, we're not coming for you, USSR. So then a couple more days later, Khrushchev sent Kennedy a coded message. This is like a top secret uh, message saying, hey, if you withdraw U.S. missiles that are in Turkey, in the country of Turkey in the Middle East, uh, in the Mediterranean, then we will take our missiles out of Cuba. How about that? You get this, we'll get this, you know, so sort of this for that type of agreement. And, uh, and then also... They added something to it. Kennedy took a couple of days to mull it over. He didn't know if it was a real message from Khrushchev, if it was kind of a fake message because it just kind of came through a back channel kind of in a secretive way. So, and then October 28th, they do connect and Khrushchev says, yeah, it is indeed real. Uh, hey, and we'll remove our Cuban missiles if you promise not to invade Cuba. That's why we have the missiles there. Uh, and so Kennedy had to give a promise not to invade Cuba. And then that also would... Uh, have the Soviet Union pull out the missiles there. And so that ends up working. They do make that agreement on October 28th. And uh, so we pull our missiles out of Turkey and Cuba pull or uh, Soviet Union pulls their missiles out of Soviet Union. And still we are at war conflicting with each other, but sort of this lowers the tension. We go from DEFCOM 2 down to DEFCOM 3, which is pretty much where we sit all of the Cold War. And so we're worried about a nuclear strike, but not on edge like we were during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Kennedy, for his credit, is seen as a hero for sort of de-escalating that conflict uh, where many of his generals uh, were saying we needed to strike first, we need to strike Cuba first and just go for the Soviet Union too, um, which would have been the end of the world. So go, good thing that he didn't, okay? And so there have been third world escalations, uh, communist countries that, or communist regimes that have taken over. Uh, we've seen the Soviet Union or Russia really is the largest, most advanced civilization that did become communist. China is another one, but they weren't necessarily that technologically advanced when they became communist. Now they are more so because they've allowed capitalistic uh, sort of advances into their economy, which has allowed new technologies in. But throughout the third world, there's a lot of third world countries that have become communist uh, during the Cold War or after the Cold War. Um, and so many of these countries are still not communist. They've sort of thrown off their communist shackles and have tried to become uh, democratic capitalist countries again. So I guess that's a winning point. You could say that at the end of the Cold War, the democratic countries, the capitalistic countries like us ended up winning, especially Eastern Europe. All these countries are now democratic capitalist countries. Uh, the Soviet Union has collapsed. You could say that Russia kind of is, although they also are kind of are not. Afghanistan, which we helped to invade, we got rid of the communist elements that were there and their sponsorship of Al-Qaeda. Uh, but Vietnam, uh, which we're going to fight a war during the Cold War against the communists, that we ended up losing to the communists. They do take over all of Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, Laos. Uh, and that's in Southeast Asia, you see North Korea, right? And then some African countries are all gonna become communist countries. Uh, there's some that are left off of this, like you don't see Venezuela here. Uh, they are not communist, they're very socialistic though. They're not, they just have a dictator uh, who runs a socialistic country. So, I mean, they're kind of similar to communistic, but you, I'm not counting that and you don't see that reflected on this map. So that's why you see some countries listed in South America, like Ecuador, Brazil. They are very socialistic, uh, but they don't necessarily become communistic. Uh, they do have communist parties, but never majority, but very socialistic influences. So, so how did the Cold War end? Um, it's going to end basically with us really not you know, as it can, the Cold War started, we're not going to talk with the Soviet Union, we're not going to have a friendly relationship. And then all of a sudden, uh, we had sort of a ping pong team that was invited to play in China against uh, the Chinese ping, communist ping pong team. If you've seen Forrest Gump, you've seen images of that. It's not really Forrest Gump that does it, but they're talking about this very pivotal part in American history. And so the ping pong team goes over there and then Nixon's like, hey, the ping pong team, the American ping pong team made it to China. I can go there, too. And so Nixon becomes the first president ever to visit China uh, as a communist country and ends up sort of opening 
uh, sort of a new relationship with them. And you see a picture, here's Richard Nixon up above, and here's Mao Zedong, uh, the famous uh, communist leader of China. And so this starts a period of what's called detente, which is a French word of the easing of strained relations. So first we ease our relationship with China, and we start talking with them, and then we start a trade relationship. And then we uh, also then start talking with the USSR. And so we have a couple of visits to Russia or the Soviet Union to Moscow, and we allow the Soviet premier uh, to come here too. And it's going to be not uh, Khrushchev, but we're going to have Brezhnev and Gorbachev and some others uh, that we are continually talking with and visiting with. Uh, so really what brings about the demise of the Soviet Union is they're going to fight uh, a war in Afghanistan, which is ironic because then we fight one there in the early 2000s after the 9-11 uh, bombings. Uh, but it's that sort of war that they fight in Afghanistan that becomes a disaster for the USSR, that becomes their Vietnam War, essentially. And they're going to lose lots of money in the will to fight and basically pull out of there in 1989, uh, losing that. And it sort of sets their economy into a mass decline and depression, uh, which is one of the things that helps to uh, sort of uh, get rid of the communists there, too. Uh, also, our leaders in the 1980s are going to be uh, really pivotal in the world to Indian communism. That's our president in the 80s, Ronald Reagan. And then the, the prime minister of, the, of Great Britain, her name is Margaret Thatcher. They're going to take a very hard line against communism and continue to support democratic free peoples and spend lots of money, give lots of military support and weapons to these countries that are fighting communists or trying to overthrow communist regimes. So they're going to support democratic revolutions, which becomes very successful, uh, and they're going to build up the U.S. military. Reagan especially is going to build it up uh, larger than it's ever been before. And so really the Russian military, you know, we had the arms race, space race that could not keep up once we decided to continue to pour money in the military uh, because they had lost so much money in Afghanistan war. They could not just invent money out of thin air. Uh, and that's going to bring about an economic collapse of communism in the Soviet Union and therefore a collapse of the Soviet Union. So also their last uh, sort of Soviet lever, uh, leader, his name is Mikhail Gorbachev. He's right here. He's famous for his book, his uh, birthmark. He still has it to this day, as in he's still alive. I should have said that. But he helped to thaw the relationship with the United States. He started what was called Glasnost, allowing the freedom of the press and transparency of the state institutions to sort of have accountability to the people. So he starts opening things up or loosening things within the Soviet Union. And then their financial crisis they're going through broke down their economy uh, and is going to start a domino effect where really uh, a lot of the countries that the Soviet Union was controlling declare their independence and they want democracy and they want capitalism. And so they overthrow and throw off the sort of communist shackles that the Soviet Union had on them. Uh, and so by 1989, Gorbachev and George H.W. Bush, the elder Bush, the senior Bush that died a couple of years ago, they declared together that the Cold War is over. There's not going to be any warfare. They're not going to fight each other. They are fine. We can be friends. And so the Soviet Union is still around for another two years. But Eastern Europe, basically all of Eastern Europe, like Poland, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, declares their independence from the Soviet Union. Germany reunifies in 1990, East and West rejoin into one Germany, just as it is today. And by 1991, the Soviet Union basically dissolves and collapses uh, because it, its economy can't keep up. Um, and so, yeah. And so here's the leadership. You see all the presidents during the Cold War from Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, and then Bush, George H.W. Bush. Uh, meets with Gorbachev, the last leader, and sort of declares an end to the Cold War. And so this goes by longer too, but this is just over the Cold War of the, because it was Vladimir Lenin up until he dies, and then Stalin takes over in the 30s, 1930s, until he dies in 1953. Then it's Nikita Khrushchev, who I mentioned, mentioned then it's Brezhnev, and then it's Gorbachev, who brings about the end of the Soviet Union. And then Boris Yeltsin becomes the first democratically elected president in Russian history because they used to have a king and monarch, the czar, before uh, the communists took over. So he becomes the first democratically elected president. Then their current leader, Vladimir Putin, becomes the second, and he hasn't ever stepped down from power. Um, so... It's not really democracy, but, and then you see China has Mao Zedong and then Deng Xiaoping is their leader throughout sort of the whole time that we are involved in this Cold War, the Soviet Union, and therefore also not like in China because they are communist too.
Okay, so that brings us to the end of the Cold War. Thanks for sticking around for a half hour. Hopefully you enjoyed this unit. Very interesting in how it affects world politics and really dominates uh, world global politics and our identity of America and who we are and the values we fight for versus our enemy, the Soviet Union, and the values that they are fighting for completely opposite of each other, polar opposites, and it brings us to this Cold War that we never actually fight, and good thing that we don't, because we would have nuked each other to smithereens, so, but thanks for watching, good luck on the test, study up, and send me questions if you have them, see you guys.